ask that you would give your tithe to your local church where you um, attend. And then anything that you would give to the prayer room is just out of generosity to go above and beyond that 10%. There are three ways that you can go about giving this evening if you would like to do so. The first is by cash or check and bringing those up to the offering buckets just here in a moment once we get done um, with the time of prayer. Uh, If you're doing check, be sure to write that out to the prayer room. The second way you can give tonight is by going on to our website. It's the prayer room, dfw.com. Click on the donate tab and you can give that way. And then the last way is I'll go to the back of the room here in a second and um, I'll have my phone with the swipe device and I can swipe debit or credit card. So those are the three ways you can give. If you guys would just join me right now as we pray for the offering, then you can go about giving. God, we thank you for these people that that love your house, that you have given vision to, that have helped fund this place, help keep its doors open, to help keep the electricity on. God, we just thank you for your faithful provision and that you're going to continue to provide in your faithfulness because you are a good father who provides for your people and you provide for the things of your heart. So we just give this to you, Lord. Have your way. Bless those who who give this evening. Bless them, Lord, above and beyond their heart's desire. Even we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you for this time together as family, as as your church, as your prayer room. We just thank you that you're always with us, and we adore you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Josh and team, for leading us in worship tonight. 
want to welcome everybody to the prayer room. Welcome to our weekly encounter service. I'm Kathleen. I'm going to talk about a couple of announcements, and then we're going to get into the time of teaching. Tonight we are doing session three of uh, the series, The Beauty and the Darkness. Is this the final one? Is this a three-part? Okay, so final one for that. We will have notes available for you guys. I'll pass the paper ones out as soon as I get done with the announcements. And then if you prefer your electronic device to access the notes, that's always an option. They are available on our website. Just go to the prayer room, dfw.com, click on the resource tab, and then under recent teachings, you can find tonight's notes um, to access them on your phone. And then as usual, just want to give the plug, if you are not committed to a weekly prayer meeting around here, come and join a sacred trust. Find a two-hour time block that works for your schedule, um, and just make a commitment to be here in this room. Set aside some time for the Lord. It helps us tremendously uh, to build this place, to know that we're going to have people in this room hour after hour, day after day. You can talk to an usher um, or a section leader, either a yellow vest or blue vest, to get some more information on uh, joining a weekly prayer meeting. And then we have some fun stuff happening here this um, coming week. So Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week, we will have six House of Prayer directors here in the, um, the prayer room doing, Brad is the director of, or he oversees a thing called the National Mission Space Co-op. And so a couple times a year, these directors meet together. They get to talk about leading a house of prayer. They get to strengthen one another, encourage one another, tell their stories of defeat, tell their stories of success, because all of that is just helpful when they are doing the same thing of directing a house of prayer, regardless of where it is in the nation. And so we have a couple people from California coming. We have uh, some from Florida, some from Houston, some from Jersey coming from across the nation to be here to um, have this time together. And so they're going to be at the prayer room Monday through Wednesday with Brad, mostly upstairs, just talking a bunch of leadership things. Um, and so just want to let you guys know that that's going on. And if you just think about it, pray for them because they have a really tough job. And, um, and so we just want this time for them to be really strengthening and vision casting for them and for them to bond together. There are new people um, that are directors that are joining for the first time with this uh, particular co-op meeting. And so we just want them to have you know, quick bonding with the others that have been a part of it a little bit longer. And so just pray for them, pray for the Holy Spirit to encounter them and to, for them to leave um, this week just feeling refreshed and feeling re-envisioned um, and fueled to do the thing that the Lord has called them to do. And then on those exact same days, Monday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this coming week, the, um, it's the uh, Global Bridegroom Fast. And so GBF is going on on those days. And so that's something that the prayer room partakes in. We fast along with others across the globe who are fasting, praying um, the prayer of come Lord Jesus, come longing for the day of his return and asking him to increase intimacy in our hearts with him, asking us to, to grow and tenderize in our love for him and our knowledge of him for our hearts to come awake and alive um, in Christ and in his love. And so we are going to be fasting with that mindset Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. And so we invite you, join in, fast from food in some way, shape, or form. Um, pick what's good and right for you. Set yourself for, for some success and um, pray along with us as we are going to be doing that. The rapid fire topic uh, for those days will be for the Global Bridegroom Fast and for the prayer room to encounter the Lord's Spirit during those three days. And then I wanted to talk with you guys about our School of Supernatural Ministry. A week from today is actually the final day of our first semester for our current round of students. And so they have been um, month after month uh, attending classes and growing. I'll tell you, um, Luke and I were actually talking last night because we both were able to teach well, not really teach. We did the outreaches with them this past Thursday and the Thursday before. And so just getting to see, like, boldness with these students and them um, just talking about, like, what the Holy Spirit's been doing and, and seeing them step out and, and grow. Like, we were just talking, like, man, they've grown a ton. And so it's just really exciting to see that. And so next week is their final class on Saturday. 
Um, and we are actually going to be um, doing a repeat of SSM semester one in the fall. And so it's going to be the exact same curriculum. Um, nothing's changing curriculum wise. We just want to do a repeat of it for anybody that was not able to do it this current semester to jump in this fall. And then what we're going to do is in the spring launch semester two and anyone that was a part of semester one currently or doing it in the fall is going to be able to choose if they want to do semester two and continue on. And so I wanted to let you guys know the dates for SSM is going to start on September 1st and last until December 22nd. There's a bunch more information about SSM on our website so you can access that anytime. And then um, I want to have Caitlin Lutz come on up at this time because we have a new semester of Immerse, our internship, starting in a couple of weeks. And so since Caitlin is over um, all of our schools, I'm going to have her talk a little bit about Immerse with y'all. Yeah, we're starting our internship this summer, um, three weeks from tomorrow, uh, May 27th. We're going to be starting young adult internship. Um, part time is designed to fit a busy schedule, so it should be accessible for a lot of people. But what this is all about is taking a season to go deep in God, get established in a lifestyle of prayer, getting established in your identity, you can learn some tools of how to read the Bible, how to encounter God while you read the Bible. Um, so it's really designed to be very practical, very equipping, very relational, very hands on um, in, in terms of taking a season to really go deep in God and set yourself up for a lifestyle of going deep in God. So it's going to be uh, May 27th, and um, there's more information out in the lobby and on the website, um, theprayerroomdfw.com. Thanks so much, Caitlin. And then the last thing that I want to talk about before I invite up Brad is I want to highlight one of the resources that we have available in our lobby. This one is called Friends of the Bi Bridegroom. It um, just basically talks about what Jesus spoke of once he was going to leave, once he would die and um, be risen to heaven. He talked about how in, in those days that his people would long for his coming and they would fast and they would pray. And so he called those ones friends, that his friends were going to long for his return. And so this resource basically is just inviting us into that, that he is speaking about us, that we have that invitation to be friends of the bridegroom, to be friends of Jesus, to be ones who carry the message of friendship with Christ, of intimacy with him, of being able to know him as near and dear in our lives, as personal in our lives, to usher in his return because he is coming back. Um, it's a three-part series. We have so many resources available in the lobby. So if this one sounds interesting to you, um, or if it doesn't, there are many other options that you can look at out in the lobby. Um, this one is $10, as are all of our three-part series that are out there. So I just encourage you guys, browse that bookstore sometime, see if there's anything of interest to you guys. I'm going to pass out notes and invite up Brad at this time. All right, good. Well, thank you guys. I'm excited to uh, get into the notes tonight. <clears throat> this has been a fun one to prep for, uh, even in the midst of the difficulty of the subject matter. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll do this. You know what, before I do, there's something I was just thinking about uh, during worship. Um, the uniqueness of what occurs in this room and in this building every week um, our Saturday night encounter services are not a true picture of what is happening around here all week long. There are people that come from, you know, I've been saying 60 plus churches. It might be as many as 100 in a month. Uh, there are people that come from dozens and dozens of churches across our region, across our nation, to this building uh, every day, every week, every month in order to encounter the Lord. People from all different denominational backgrounds to come and to worship Jesus. It is a sign and a wonder what occurs in this building. It is so unique that there are people from all those different backgrounds, all those different congregations that come not one time for a cool conference event, but that come like a steady stream through this room all month long, all year long. It is so powerful. 
what we get to do in this place. And uh, I was just thinking about that uh, during worship tonight, just what occurs in this room in the course of a month. And uh, I, I just celebrate that. I'm just so excited. I kind of have those moments every now and then where I have a self-revelation of what happens around here. You know, it's been happening all along, but there are moments where it like makes sense all of a sudden for, again, you know, like, oh my gosh, we, we do 18 hours a day of worship or, you know, oh my gosh, there's people that come here all month long, every month, every single month, every single year. It's just so wild that there's this steady stream coming through here constantly from the churches in our region and even across the nations of the earth. So I'm excited. That was just my little side note. I'm excited. So Father, we ask you tonight that you would fuel our hearts, God, regarding the importance of going deep in the message of Jesus's beauty. Tonight, as we talk about the other side of it, we talk about the rise of darkness in the last generation. I pray that, God, it would be a provoking agent to those that are in this room, those that are watching online, and those that will hear this message down the road, that you would provoke our hearts about the importance of being plumb-lined into the nature of Jesus, gazing on the beauty of the Lord, in order that we might have light within us to overcome the darkness in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, tonight is the Beauty and the Darkness Session 3 entitled, The Darkness That Blinds. <clears throat> now, what we've done more or less in this series, we did an introduction in session one. Session two was the fun one. It was all focused on Jesus's beauty shining forth into the final generation. And uh, it was a glorious subject of the revelation of Jesus, of, of his beauty, specifically that word beauty, not just the fact of Jesus, not even just the majesty or the bigness of Jesus, but the beauty of the Lord made a, a revelation in the earth in the final generation. And what we want to talk about in this final session is kind of uh, uh, bringing these two uh, realities together. We're going to contrast tonight the beauty from last week. We're going to contrast it now tonight with the wickedness that's prophesied, uh, prophesied to rise in the final generation. And so this title, The Darkness That Blinds, uh, you think about uh, being blinded by light. Well, there's a generation, it's the one that we're living in and that's going to uh, devolve into every form of evil practice. This generation is going to be blinded by darkness. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. This uh, first idea of uh, Jesus uh, being the, the beautiful God in the final generation, and at the same time, in the exact same uh, uh, generation, in the same hours of history, that the brilliance and beauty of Jesus will be made the brightest, those same hours, the darkness and the wickedness will be made the darkest. It's such an interesting contrast. The darkest dark and the lightest light happening at the same time. And where we identify Jesus as uh, giving us this invitation into beauty, into relationship, into the light and into truth. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the contra of that, and that is the attitudes of the rebellious and the wickedness that will be inviting and will be alluring the people of God and the lost generation into increased levels of wickedness and depravity. We want to obviously be part of the shining forth of brightness in this last generation. But uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a dark, dark time. So there will likewise, <clears throat> the, the generation will likewise perceive Jesus through the dark lens. And so his beauty will be missed and even distorted. Now what I want to say by that is that... In this last generation, it's like the Lord is going to give everybody 100% of what they really want. Do you want the Lord? You can have as much of Him as you want. Do you want darkness? There will be more of that available than has ever been in any generation. And those that are being blinded by the darkness will have a distorted view of Jesus, though His brightness will be shining brighter than at any other time. Though the church will be uh, walking in greater measure of revelation and the church will be shining forth, the beauty of the Lord will be made more clear than it has ever been in the midst of that, the blinders that will rest on the majority of the generation that is saying no to Jesus. That darkness will blind them so much they won't even be able to see the brightest brightness of Jesus. And that's what we're talking about. 
Well, how does this uh, come to pass? Part A here in the notes. If you want to access our notes online, they're available as well. Just click on the resource tab, and then recent teachings, and the message that will, uh, will come up should be session three here. And uh, you can access that, uh, those notes if you want to access those online. I want to look here at part A on page one. This very painful truth that is identified in the Gospels, that men love the darkness. This uh, verse here, John 3.19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Here's the assessment. The reality from heaven's perspective, when heaven looks at the planet and looks at the hearts of mankind in a general sense, the verdict is this. People don't like truth and light and righteousness. People actually prefer, when given a choice, they prefer darkness and evil. He says the reason they prefer it is because the natural inclinations of their heart are evil. So that which is going to align more with their thought process, more with their desires, more with their way that they want their life to, uh, to be ordered, it's going to be darkness, not light. This is really bad news. This is the reason everybody starts off lost instead of saved. Everyone starts off in darkness because the natural inclination of the human heart is towards darkness. Bad. It's a bad deal. Furthermore, I love the way that it, this is written. I, I don't love the fact of it, but I, I think that the way that it's written is poetic and powerful. This is the verdict. It's a verdict from heaven. This is a, a, a factual assessment. This is heaven has done all the math, all the homework, all the legal uh, back work, and has given a verdict over the reality about the natural assessment of man's heart. Men love darkness. That's bad. Part B, spiritual darkness will fill the earth. Now, the problem with this final generation, remember the natural inclination of the heart is darkness. Now, we can get saved. That's the good news. We can give our heart to the Lord. We can turn away from darkness. So it's not like we're doomed. It's not like there's no hope. But we do want to understand the natural default. Because a default situation will be the majority situation. Okay? Okay? And with the verdict being that lights come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil, they are going to choose darkness by and large. As that's just the case throughout the generations, now part B, we're looking at a generation where spiritual darkness is going to fill every sphere of society, every sphere of life. This is evil beckoning. I don't like that idea, but we've all felt the... The lure of sin beckoning us into something that we shouldn't do. Well, imagine if that, whatever you were feeling in your spirit, in your in your, you know, spiritual battle, whatever you were feeling, what if that thing got a megaphone and was able to broadcast to a generation? What if that megaphone was the size of the state of Texas broadcasting to the world? We're talking about a megaphone beckoning a generation into into darkness it will take everything within an individual to withstand that darkness well actually all it will take is jesus within that individual and that individual fully committed to the lord but there will be a loud sound in the final generation beckoning even the church into darkness and compromise it will fill it will be a surrounding pervading revelation uh, uh, or invitation <clears throat> there will be increased opportunities to sin this is really bad news the natural inclination of the heart is to sin and we're prophesied in the word of god that the final generation will be given an even louder invitation to sin even more opportunities to sin and these will be powerful demonically charged invitations this is called the day of deep darkness Now, I don't want to just talk about the bad. That's the reason we did an introductory session and we spent all of the last session talking about the beauty of Jesus, which is the antidote to all this. I mean, there is a way out. But I don't want us to only talk about the way out. I want us to understand the powerful delusion that will come upon this final generation, which will be powerful. So that we don't just think, okay, I'm good, I I I prayed the prayer. I had my quiet time, you know, this morning. We're going to need a little bit more than a quiet time. 
We're going to need a little bit more than prayed the prayer. We are going to need to be focused and captivated by the man Jesus. And as long as our gaze, I don't mean our check mark, I'm a Christian on the form, what religion are you? I mean as long as our gaze is on Jesus, we'll be fine. But gaze requires attention. Gaze requires focus. Gaze requires uh, uh, getting the, the attention back again. You know, it is impossible for you to stare at anything without blinking for too long. You're going to blink. Just make sure when the eyes open that you haven't turned your head and you're still looking where you're supposed to be looking, looking at. That there is a, a, an intentionality that is going to be required. And without that intentionality, I just don't want us to underestimate the powerful delusion of darkness that is prophesied for the final generation. Because it will win many that thought they were good to go. No, I'm good. I got this. We need to not have an arrogant approach to the end times. We need to not have an arrogant approach to the rising darkness. We need to not be fearful like, oh, I'm going to get swept away. But at the same time, we want to have a very sober revelation that all will be swept away who are not following the very clear and simple prescription, gaze on the beauty of the Lord. Have our focus fixed on Jesus. And if we do that, we're going to be golden. So look at this verse here, uh, Isaiah 59, 9 through 10, describing the generation. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows, like the blind we grope along. Describing the generation that the Lord is going to return to. A time period where the generation is described as, we were looking for light, but all we found was more darkness. We were looking for the brightness of Jesus. We were looking for, for truth, but we are walking in such deep shadows, like the blind groping about. This is describing a generation walking in deep darkness. Now, if you're walking in deep darkness, just get your flashlight and you're set. But without that flashlight, it's deep darkness. This is the way that the prophet, by the Spirit of the Lord, is describing the natural and the spiritual clim uh, climate of the generation that the Lord returns. This deep darkness, this generation that's described as walking in deep shadows, as all darkness. I just don't want us to dismiss passages like this and just go, neat poetic language. I want our hearts to be struck by this and recognize the light must be at its brightest when the generation is prophesied to be the darkest. It is essential that we understand this point. So I know tonight sounds a little bit like a killjoy after, after coming off of session two, talking about the beauty of Jesus, but we need to recognize the, the, the contrast. It's important. Or otherwise, the antidote doesn't make as much sense. Nobody takes the cure, you know, to the plague if you don't realize you have the plague. You've got to recognize the reality in order to fully then embrace what it is that the Lord wants to do. <coughs> Looking for light, but all is darkness. It's important that we catch this. All right, well, part C is some hope here. It's hope, but there is the caveat that we have a responsibility to respond. I always uh, use the analogy of someone warning me that I'm about to get hit by a bus. I'm standing just a little too far out into the intersection. I was looking up. Imagine you're, you know, you're at Times Square for the first time. And you're looking up and you're seeing all the signs and stuff. And you happen to be standing in a, in a lane. And you're just standing there and someone yells, Bus! Get out of the way! You still have a choice to either move or get mowed over by the bus you have a choice to respond to the warning. Well, the good news is that we will only participate in the darkness that blinds according to the measure that we've decided to participate in it. It will be a decision. It's not like you're just going to be blinded just because you're blinded. Darkness blinds and keeps us from the revelation of Jesus, but that blinding only comes by our decisions. I said it this way, the good news related to this, I will call it a very uneasy point. 
Okay? The, uh, the good news related to this is that we will only be led astray by darkness that we choose. Chosen darkness. Well, who would choose darkness? Well, I hope no one, but the Word of God says a whole generation is going to actually do it. So let us not be counted among those that choose the darkness. We choose either by our decision to walk in dark ways or embrace dark ideas or accept darkness in our lives that we could easily dispel but choose to hang on to instead. It's a choice. Whatever the case, the beckoning from the Holy Spirit is that we would come up out of darkness. We would come out of darkness. It's a choice. It's a decision. We have the option to either tolerate the darkness in our life or to come at it head on. We have the choice to either embrace dark thinking, dark ideas, or to dispel those ideas. You have power over your mind. So you can take your thoughts captive, make them obedient to Christ. You can. Or you can choose not to and allow that darkness to seep in and have place. Darkness in our decisions, darkness all around us, we have a choice. And the admonition all the way through, but especially so in the last generation, it's Revelation 18.4, the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, all of the angels, all the witness of heaven, everybody upstairs saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. You know, there are some that uh, wonder if the end time judgments are going to impact the church, are going to impact those that love the Lord. Well, this passage makes it really clear who will be impacted by those plagues. Those plagues will in fact impact those that have not come out of the sin of the plans and and of the agenda of the Antichrist in that last generation. (coughs) So if we come out and it says, you will not receive any of her plagues. But there are plagues in the book of Revelation that are designed. I mean, they are specifically calculated design by God in order to judge sin and wickedness in the final generation. So long as we come out of those things, we're good to go. So you don't need to worry about being here or not being here. You need to worry about living in the light or living in darkness. We do not need to have an escapist thought process about the end times. Instead, the only thing we need to escape is darkness. You don't need to be afraid of God. You need to be afraid of sin. God is good. Sin is bad. Avoid sin, you'll be set. God knows how to do this, I promise. Part D. Once darkness, or once we are in darkness, and this is both a natural reality and a, a, a spiritual reality, so kind of put the two together here. Once in darkness, our eyes adjust to the lack of light. And after a while, we no longer seek the light because we've become comfortable in the darkness. And actually, bright light seems quite undesirable. Once your eyes have adjusted, you do not want somebody to turn on the bright light. This darkness effectively blinds us to the light. And it becomes the new lens through which we see everything around us. Many things lurk in the dark that we are unaware of because we cannot see clearly in darkness. You know how many critters are out there that are nocturnal? You go out in the dark and you look down on the ground and you don't see anything. You turn the flashlight on, you find out you got snakes and creepy crawlers and everything else down there. You might have all kinds of men or a junk. And... We don't see it because our eyes have adjusted to the darkness and we're still seeing, but we're not seeing clearly. This is what's going to happen in the final generation if we're not careful. If you immerse yourself in darkness, you think you're seeing everything that there is to see, but there is much lurking in those shadows. And when your eyes have adjusted to darkness, when we become comfortable in sin, we become comfortable living in in compromise, We now perceive everything through that lens of darkness. And it causes us to misperceive everything. A whole generation isn't going to be able to see what is right, good, and true. 
because they are going to be seeing through a lens that has embraced darkness. And so the things that are good and right, they won't even seem desirable. They won't even seem like the the real deal. This presents us with a very veiled and inaccurate version of reality and is the trouble of the last day drama for all who are not rooted in his beauty, not rooted in the goodness of God, the truth of God, the light of the Lord, the counsel of God in the final generation. This will be a very real problem. Well, how do we get that way? It's a generation that will have been feeding on sin for decades. You know, whenever, whenever somebody gives themselves over to sin, let me just real quick, I always want to make this point. It's so important that we understand the difference between making a mistake which you are grieved by and repentant of and asking God, help me not wind up there again. Let me just tell you, that's normal. That's godly. That's human. Nobody doesn't sin. I've never met anybody that doesn't sin. There's nobody that doesn't sin. So you're like, oh, I can't believe I sinned. I can believe it. You're a sinner. It's how you handle what you did. So making a mistake and going, ah, help God, I repent. Help, that's good. That's right. You'll be doing that till you're dead. Oh no, I'll I'll get so holy I won't do that anymore. You're a liar. You will sin. Just sin the right way. Get back up on the horse. Call it sin. Don't make mistake. Don't don't uh, make uh, you know. Um, well, don't, don't try to cover it over. Don't make excuses about it. Call it sin. I did it. I'm a sinner. Sin. Bad. Help. I don't want to do it. Make wise decisions to not wind up in the same dumb boat again next week. Okay. This is normal. This is Christianity. Okay. I'm not talking about that. That's right and good and normal for every human being that loves the Lord. That's normal. I'm talking about giving over to it. Here's what giving over looks like. I did it, I like it, and I'm doing it again tomorrow. Very different perspective. Very different. And when we give ourselves over and sustain a season of unrepentance about a sin, there are major long-term ramifications of that decision. Major ones. In addition to the short-term ramifications. I mean, if you do any sin has natural short-term ramifications, like immediate negatives. You feel distant from God. There's, you know, issues, whatever, whoever you sinned against or however that works, like, there's connections there and stuff that's not good. I mean, it's, anytime you sin, there are natural consequences for that sin that are immediate or more or less immediate. That's already bad enough, but we don't often think about the long-term ramifications of what happens because of a season of compromise. And, and maybe it's forever compromise. And you realize you can be like walking in the light in this area, this area, this area, this area, and totally fully committed to the darkness in this area you can do that i don't but it's possible well then there's no ramifications for this this is and this this and there's major ramifications for this one that's how it is okay those ramifications <coughs> you're always worse off down the line when you make an agreement with darkness the resulting reality is far worse down the road than when you started What we're going to be looking at here in this last generation is not just that there's going to be sin increasing. We want to talk about what does it look like when sin increases for a decade, two decades, three decades? What are the long-term ramifications? What are the increased problems, the more bad down the road? When you're talking about decades of societal compromise, decades of rampant personal sin, increased fellowship with darkness. It's all going to snowball out of control down the road. That's where this is going. The end will only come when the position of the human race and the age has, has devolved into a season of significant increase of wickedness. 
and deep darkness. That's when the end actually comes. When fullness of sin is reached, that's actually when the end of the age occurs. Now, I don't like that fact, but it's a clearly biblical fact. Like that's, that's how this works. We are not going to see the return of Jesus before the generation has reached full wickedness. That's the way the Bible reads. So I don't like that, but that is reality. So we're looking at sin increasing and snowballing over decades. You probably already know this. This is kind of spiritual warfare 101, but I'm going to maybe say it a way that you haven't thought about before. Sin is demon food. When you sin, you are feeding a spirit. That's how demons eat. They eat, they feed, they grow, they mature by participation from a human being in the sin arena. Either this area, this area, this area. Now, if you've got an angry dog and you stop feeding him, eventually he's going to perish. Okay, but if you keep feeding an angry dog, he's going to get bigger and badder and be the meanest dog on the block. And this is the picture regarding the way that sin works. Sin is never satisfied. It grows like a cancer. It never is satisfied. You know, we have this lie that the enemy, he's told all of us, and he tells us again and again, oh, you could just do this one little thing. It won't be a big deal. The problem with that is the step to go from I'm not going to do that little thing to I am going to do that little thing is the exact same step as doing that little thing to going to the next level of depth of darkness in that little thing. It's the same step. It's a step this big. To take the first step, you've actually now got an issue of conscience because you've already taken the first step. Now you're more likely to take the second step because it's only another three inches further than the last step. See, this is the problem. Ah, you can take this little step. It won't be a big deal. Sin grows like a cancer. It is never satisfied until it reaches fullness. The desire of sin is to grow and become rampant in your life. Now you guys know this verse. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. not trying to do a spiritual warfare session tonight. I just want to give us the little 101 here. Our struggle. You are in a struggle. You are. You may not like that. You may want to do away with it. You are in a struggle. And it's never against a human being. Never. It's always against demons. Now you can broad, broaden out what demons means in this category and that category. I'm just calling them demons for the sake of this conversation. You are always always in a fight with demons and if you don't think you are you will fight the wrong fight you'll be fighting that person like they're really the bad guy they're not the bad guy the demon that made them say that thing is the bad guy in fact maybe they're not even the bad guy at all it's the demon that's got you so mad at them that's the bad guy maybe it's not about you or them it's our struggle is against demonic forces. It's a real struggle. So, <clears throat> you can either feed those demons or starve them. The problem is, we're talking about decades of strong men being fed from every angle societal, individual, demonic, witchcraft, every sort of sin imaginable being fed i don't mean fed a little bit off the 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 scraps off the side of the table i mean a steak was cooked in order to feed that thing we're talking about high level feeding here for a generation decades feeding demonic entities demonic presence that's really bad and that's the generation we're walking into that's what's happening right now and it's only going to continue to increase You can't, there's a thousand categories that you just can't imagine that we're going to be able to just get by with what has been happening at a societal level in areas of injustice and murder and everything else that demons are being fed because we are in a struggle. And so when those forces are actually 
fed and appeased, they grow and they strengthen. And what the strengthening means is increased measure of influence, increased level of difficulty to say no next time. That's the next point. Losing all sense of morality. A generation. See, I'm talking about a I'm talking about the whole planet. Not five people or you. I'm talking about a planet called planet Earth, the inhabitable one in our solar system. That planet losing its mind. Okay? And losing all sense of morality because <clears throat> the longer a person is unrepentant in sin, the harder it is for them to get out of it. It's not impossible, but it's harder. And then harder. And then harder. That's, that's a problem. Second, the harder it is to change their behavior, even to recognize the evilness of the activity. The longer you're in it, the more excusable it becomes. The less dark it becomes. The heart becomes callous. What was previously a grievous thing. Oh, I just... Ah, becomes permissible. Becomes enjoyable. Becomes promotable. The longer unrepentant sin goes on, the more we lose our sense of morality about the issue. And when we start losing our sense of morality in one area, it's easier to lose it in another and another and another. What about a generation that is set out to lose its morality? What about a generation that's celebrating it? Saying, we cannot wait to be the most immoral group of people that has ever lived. They will have as much of what they want as they want. We're talking about a generation that's headed that direction. Bad news. You know, just the thought process here of serial killers. They didn't start off at age two doing that. But at age five, ten, twelve, whatever, they started to participate with the spirit of murder. Somewhere, in the, somewhere down the line. And that looked like one thing or another. And then it escalated. And it escalated. And it escalated. That's how a serial killer is born. The escalation, the snowballing of sin. There are all sorts of psychology, this and all that. All that's true too, I'm sure. But when you get to the root of it, it's a sin issue. Somebody participated with the spirit of murder and went a step further, a step further, a step further. And now they're in total chaos. And they're, most of them, when you talk to them, they don't even see anything wrong with what they've been doing. They celebrate it. How did they get there? They've lost all sense of morality. And it started with the first time they fellowshiped and participated with the spirit of murder. And then it went again and again and again. That's how this works. I just want us to understand the process here. We're talking about a generation for decades that will be aggressively agreeing with darkness. What happens five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years? We're already seeing some of the major snowball points in our society right now that were decisions that were made in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. We're already seeing the snowball. It's only going to increase. A generation feeding on sin for decades. <coughs> All right. Part C. Well, actually, no, I want to give you that point there I've got at the bottom of the page. Part B. This uh, is going to rise to the climax where, think about this for a second. We're not doing a study right now on the Antichrist, but just your short little you know, reminder here. There's an Antichrist. He's a real human being. He's really going to come on the scene. And it's going to be really bad. That's what you need for the background. Here's what you need for the context that we're talking about here. The planet the one you live on, is going to vote this guy into office and celebrate his decisions. The planet you live on, the generation you're in, devolving to a point where six billion people think this is a good idea. We want that guy in charge. And actually do that guy's agenda. And if it's not 6 billion, it's 5 billion. Whatever. A generation. That's crazy. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord. Those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, 
It's talking about the final alliance that's made with the Antichrist and his government is defined as sin upon sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. That's the way that his leadership is defined and the entire generation walking that direction, going where the Spirit of the Lord has not led. We're talking about a generation that reaches the climax of sin and depravity, not in a moment, but in an escalation that occurs over decades. I believe we're in those decades now. I fully believe we are in those decades. A decade in, maybe, two, I don't know. But we are in the decades where, these, where this is all real right now, and it is only escalating. I don't know how many decades we've got left, but for the sake of how big and bad wickedness could get, I hope we don't have many. Because this is going to get real bad. <coughs> Part C, top of page uh, three. I gave you a couple of lists. There are probably five more. But I give you a couple of lists where the scripture lists off end time sins. So not just sin, but end time sin. Where the passage clearly makes it known. This is an end time passage dealing with the major trends of the final generation. The major way that the generation will relate to each other, relate to God, relate to Satan. The major ways that the, that the people will, will interact. And I gave you a couple of verses here that define some really, really bad things that are sin reaching its maturity. And the process that gets us there. When a generation embraces these things. Just reading the Revelation 9 verse. <coughs> Revelation 9 is focused more on the lost world. And 2 Timothy 3 is focused more on the church. I think I'm more scared by the 2 Timothy verses. But the Revelation 9 says, The rest of mankind that weren't killed by the plagues that came before this moment that are described here. So 100% of the generation of the lost did not repent of the works of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols. They did not repent of murder. They did not repent of witchcraft or of the various versions of their sexual immorality or of theft. These are primary sins describing what a normal lost person does in a week. Why put these on there if this is like 1% of the population? You know, the rest of mankind didn't repent of this. It's talking about 100% of the lost world that's committed to wickedness. Saying they didn't repent. Repent of what? They're lying and, you know, dabbling with a little bit of internet pornography? No, they didn't repent of murder and witchcraft and demon worship. This is the stuff they didn't repent of. Well, in order to not repent of it means they did it. More than that, if they're not repenting of it, it means it's a lifestyle choice they've chose to camp out in. They're going to do it again next week. This is what the last generation is going to be walking in. This is a time of deep, deep darkness. It is so important that the church be walking in the brightness of the light. Not dabbling in the compromise. That we have light to shine. That there be a true contrast between the light and the darkness in that hour. Love growing cold. You guys have heard me talk about this before, but in the subject of decades of sin being fed upon, the issue for the generation, lost or saved, will be about growth. Growing. Growing towards the Lord or away. Lost or saved. Growth. And the idea that's presented here about Christians being able to grow cold. To grow cold. Not start cold. Grow cold. Hot. A little less hot. Kind of warm. Lukewarm. Touching on cold. Kind of cold. Ice cold. Grow, one way or the other. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. 
a generation for decades growing in coldness. Lost and saved. Growing in coldness. Coldness towards the Lord. Coldness towards truth. Coldness towards reality. Many false things will be presented that are not real. But a coldness towards reality that will then make unreality seem a lot more reasonable. Growing cold. The love of most growing cold. The antidote is stand firm to the end. Stand firm to the end. You know that standing firm is going to take effort. You'll not stand firm just because you stood firm yesterday. You're going to have to take pains to make sure your standing is still standing today. Stand firm to the end. It's a warning out of the mouth of Jesus to the last generation. The wickedness will increase so much it will cause the love of most human beings to grow cold. Stand firm. And you'll be okay. But if you don't stand firm, you're going to be in trouble. That's the objective. That's the, uh, the, the point. A generation that's fully committed to their iniquity. Gave you the Daniel uh, 8 passage that talks about the rebellious in the final generation described as becoming completely wicked. Rebellious people from God's perspective where God goes, wow, they actually have completed wickedness. They couldn't get more wicked than that. From, the heaven, from heaven's perspective, a rebellious generation reaching the fullness of evil, it says, then the Antichrist will rise. Then, after. See, the only way the Antichrist is really even going to be welcomed is everybody's already so wicked already. Not the church, not those that have stood firm to the end, but the generation, the lost generation. And then the stern looking or the uh, fierce looking king, this master of intrigue, the Antichrist, will rise. Will rise when? When the rebels have become completely wicked. When the generation has reached its fullness of evil. The way that's going to happen is decades. The way you become completely something is you start off incomplete and you take a step. And then you take another step, you take another step. Well, that's good when we're talking about filling up your bank account. It's completely full. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. When you're talking about completeness, fullness of joy, that's a good thing. When you're talking about completely wicked, it's going to take some time. It's going to take a world committed to evil for a while in order to reach completely wicked. All right. What does all this result in? A generation that boldly rejects Jesus' ways. With all everything we just talked about so far paints the spiritual climate. Talks about what we're talking about here. What we were, uh, the climate's going to look like in the earth. What we understand is from the last session and everything else we've been looking at here over the course of the past few months, the final generation is going to have access to the most amount of truth ever is going to have the greatest witness from the church. We'll see the most amount of miracles. We'll have access to the greatest measure of the presence of God. At the same time, there will be the greatest measure of wickedness, the greatest measure of the pursuit of evil, the greatest measure of all the darkness that we've just been talking about. They're both rising together. This generation will also be filled with hate Perversion in every evil practice in greater measure than all the other generations previous. Conflict will result as both realities reach fullness together. And the majority of the globe will take up a bold, aggressive, and very public stance against Jesus and his teachings. That will be the the, uh, climax of the conflict. The majority of the earth will say, we don't like God. They'll see Jesus' ways as a prison. I gave you the Psalm 2, talking about the kings of the earth and the final generation. The kings, the major leaders of the earth, says they will rise up and the rulers will band together against the Lord and against His anointed, against Jesus. And they will say, let us break their chains, let us throw off their shackles. This is talking about Jesus' ways, His righteousness, the Bible, truth, 
saying, let us take all of that and cast it off. Let us take the shackles of the enemy. Uh, uh, They're referring to God. Let us take all of his bondage and cast it off. They are going to be looking at and identifying the, the word of God, the teachings of Jesus, the ways of the kingdom of God, and they're going to be calling them shackles. Thinking of Jesus' objective as a prison sentence. That's bad. They're going to re- prefer death to repentance. I want you to think about that for a second. Think about you on your worst day. You did something really stupid. All right? And somebody comes to you, an angel from heaven, comes to you and says, Well, we have a little issue today. Okay? This one was kind of a big deal. So, um, I either need you to repent or I'm just going to strike you down. Okay. I'd like to repent, please. Good. That's why I'm here. I was hoping you'd say that. Awesome. Good. Go ahead and do your repentance thing. God, I'm sorry. Awesome. Good. (laughs) This will be presented to the final generation and they will choose death over repentance. That is intense. That is an intense statement from a generation about the increase of sin in that generation. (coughs) The kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else. Called to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us. When giant rocks and mountains fall on you, you die. Okay? Giant rocks, fall on us. Giant rocks, Kill us. Why do you want to die so bad? Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. You know, you could just repent. Everything be cool. You just repent. All this goes away. You, you wind up filled with the Holy Spirit. You get to walk in righteousness. You have the joy of the Lord. You live to live forever in, in heaven instead of hell forever. Just repent. No! Die. I'd rather die. Like, this is crazy. A generation, remember, the kings, the mighty men, and everyone else will say, we'd just rather die than repent and have to face that man. Dang. That's a generation that has devolved. Okay? (coughs) Tuning out truth in favor of comfort. This verse in 2 Timothy 4.3. Long before the generation reaches the climax, there's these decades where it starts and then it grows and then it grows and then it grows. Let me tell you one of the ways that it starts. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they still want doctrine. They still want Bible teaching. They still want religious ideas. But instead, to suit their desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their ears want to hear. So what this looks like is, they're actually voting in teachers and surrounding themselves with leaders. Like, we don't want that leader. Why? He talks too much Bible All the hard Bible stuff. We don't want him. We want this guy. Why do you want this guy? This guy says I can sleep with whoever I want. That's the guy I want leading me. This guy says it's fine to be in compromise in this area. This guy says sin is kind of like irrelevant. That's who I want to be my leader. I want to surround myself with teachers. They're going to tell me what my itching ears want to hear that will allow me to be comfortable in my sin. Tuning out truth in favor of what is comfortable. I just tell you, all of us have a little of this in us. I'd rather hear that which is going to help me stay comfortable than that which would be conflicting with my thought processes. It is good to have people disagree with you. It is good to have people call you out on sin. It is good to have things and people and teachers and truth in your life that is contra to your desires because remember you are inherently evil men love darkness there is nothing good in you spare christ 
But you still have a sin nature that is alive today and wants stuff. It is good to be told the truth and to have people that differ in opinion from you in order that you might have to listen to it and process it with the Lord and allow the Lord to kick you around a little and go, Duh, don't do, just listen to your friend, they're right. That thing you want to do, that's crazy. You'll wind up, I'll, remember that message Brad preached on Saturday? You'll wind up one of those guys. It's good. It's important. There's a generation that will become notorious for identifying evil things as right things. That which we know is evil, that which the word says is evil, that which just basic human understanding would identify as evil, a generation becoming notorious as looking at that and identifying it as good. Celebrate this. I heard the most vile thing I think I have ever heard this past week. It was one of the most vile things. It, wasn't, it, it was so vile, but it's not like the kind of thing that you couldn't share. In fact, I think it's important to share it. There was some thing. I was walking through a restaurant, and somebody was doing a, a there was a, co- a comedian that was like doing a, a roast for the president and was, was telling all these jokes and was doing all this stuff. And they got to, this, uh, this lady got to a point where she said something about, I don't want to impeach President Trump because then we'd wind up with Mike Pence. They said, Mike Pence believes that abortion is murder. And then went on to tell some of the vilest jokes I have ever heard in my life about abortion and people were laughing. It was the most vile things I've ever heard. And, and here it is, it's being celebrated. Here, here's this comedian given the, the platform for the roast for the president. It's, I mean, this is, I couldn't believe what my ears were hearing. We have celebrated murder. And we've, we've propagated it. We've made it a joke. Oh, I couldn't believe what my ears were hearing. And it's celebrated as a good thing. That's what was clearly out of the messages. How can you think that this isn't a good thing? This is a good thing. We're talking about a generation that will celebrate evil, celebrate darkness as wisdom. Calling darkness, not just not darkness, calling it wisdom and right and true and good. A generation that will do that in every area. We've already taken major steps and it's only going to increase. The mirror of natural darkness. I just find this one interesting. Best way I can describe it. (coughs) This is an interesting reality that as darkness will be increasing in every area of the spiritual world, as darkness is increasing already, and we've been talking about it, you know, in this session, There's this interesting parallel which God is going to do. It's so interesting that while darkness will increase in the spiritual realm, God is going to release darkness in the natural realm in the most profound, unprecedented ways that have ever occurred in human history. So there's this mirror of, oh, you want darkness? I'll give you darkness. Darkness being... Uh, uh, celebrated in culture and in, in uh, immorality and everything else, God says, I will now send you physical, real darkness in some ways that should get your attention if you're paying attention just a little bit. The first, the day of the Lord is defined as a day of darkness, distress, anguish, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of blackness, A day of deep darkness. This is the way that the Lord himself describes the day of the Lord. Well, part of that actually has to do with the physical clouds. Even the sun will be darkened by clouds. Why write that if it's just talking about a normal storm? Why even write it in the Bible? You know, there's a normal storm and it's kind of dark outside because the clouds are so thick. And then, you know, two hours later, the storm's gone. It's not like 
Bible worthy. Like, don't put that in and call it a verse. I mean, that's just a Tuesday in the spring. You know, that's just kind of how it is. Okay? This is talking about the sun being darkened by clouds in a way that was worth writing into the Bible. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on the day of clouds and darkness. Deep darkness, clouds. So I'm, I'm imagining some measure of supernatural thunderclouds. Maybe it's the same thunderclouds that darkened the day, middle of the day, but they stay for weeks or months. Maybe it's those same clouds, but they're so thick, you can't even see anything. The darkest of dark. Let's go on to the next one. The sun will be turned to darkness. You know, solar eclipses are normal. That's normal. You don't put that in the Bible if it's something that's been happening for thousands of years. You know, a solar eclipse, like we had a couple of months ago. Or a really, really big one. See, we've dumbed this down to make this a solar eclipse, but that's not what it says. It says the sun will be turned to darkness. This is not a solar eclipse. This is the sun turned to darkness. This is very different. And it's a statement from God about the darkness that's pervading the earth. The sun will be turned. Turned by who? By God. Not by a dark cloud. Not by a solar eclipse. God will turn the sun to darkness. That's intense. Smoke from the abyss. Every expression of unnatural darkness will be unexpected. But this is one of the more disturbing examples that I can see of the darkness in the last days. When he opened the abyss, that's hell, smoke from hell rose like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. Now, if this smoke rises over, you know, one little town and it lasts, you know, a couple of days, you don't write that in the Bible. This is talking about, for the first time that we have record of, hell, which is described as a place of everlasting burning, for the first time ever, we're told hell opens up, hot air rises, the smoke in hell comes out. How much smoke is that? A lot. It darkens the sun. This isn't like for 15 minutes. This is the sun being darkened by hell smoke. Darkened. So now, whatever shadow that casts, whatever amount of you know, area that covers over in the Middle East or wherever, I, that's going to take up a lot. It's going to be bad. It's going to be real darkness. The next one. This is the, perhaps the most peculiar. This is the most mysterious. I'll say it that, that way. One of the chosen end time plagues that God has stored up for the wicked of the final generation is the fifth bowl of wrath. Now, I just want to say this again. It is a specific plague that God has identified a long, long, long time ago that's in your Bible that is going to happen. So this isn't, it just happens, this isn't one of the things that are going to happen in the end times. This is a specific calculated event that God has invented. Okay? <clears throat> What's mysterious about it is that we're talking about a judgment being poured out on the kingdom of the Antichrist. And this darkness pours out like a liquid. So that's mysterious. But instead of it filling 100% of the earth, it doesn't. It flows to and only fills spaces identified as being part of the kingdom of the beast. Which we know there will be lots of places, not a majority, but places all over, that will not be part of the kingdom of the beast. This pours out like a liquid, but it's a liquid that's selective. And it only goes where the kingdom of, of the Antichrist, the kingdom of the beast, has its root system. This is a very interesting pouring out this very interesting bowl. And here's what it does. <coughs> Everywhere it shows up, 
everywhere it, it lands or it touches, wherever it pours out, it says it plunges that area into darkness. Plunges. Think about somebody being violently baptized. They are plunged into the water. They are submersed. There's a splash. There's a gasping for air. Okay? Plunged. It says... This bowl will be poured out and everywhere that the kingdom of the Antichrist is will be plunged into darkness. This is supernatural to its height. This is crazy. This judgment is talking about a parallel, a mirror of, oh, you want darkness? I'll give you darkness. You thought there were going to be no consequences for this evolution of darkness that you've been on a multi-decade journey hitting fullness? You thought there would be no response from heaven? The fifth bowl of wrath will plunge into darkness 100% of the earth that is committed to the Antichrist and is in agreement with his kingdom. Plunge into darkness. We know from the book of uh, Exodus that this plague was done once before in a similar way during the exodus, during them coming out of Egypt, and it says it was darkness that could be felt. The only way darkness can be felt is if there's bad juju in the darkness, if there's stuff in the darkness, if there's those demons that have been being fed for decades, now given full reign in the darkness. Manifestation as the kingdom of, the, of darkness is plunged into darkness. The kingdom of the beast, rather. Pretty intense. Worship team, you can come on up. I'm going to finish up here. A generation enraged over his righteous judgments. We know that the judgments of the Lord are good and right and true. It's impossible for God to do anything bad. It's impossible for God to do anything uncalculated. Like he just popped off one day and started getting crazy. Started doing judgments. God does not make mistakes. God is slow to anger. He is abounding in love. Notice it's slow to anger, not never angry. He is slow to anger. Slow, slow, patient, patient. But patience and slowness does eventually have a moment. He will be full in wrath. The bowls are the bowls of the fullness of God's wrath being poured out. When God releases his judgments, it's a good thing. His judgments are not bad. His judgments are good. But there will be a world raging against those judgments. Declaring that God is evil, that God is mean, that God is distant, that He's unjust, that these judgments are too severe, not recognizing the weight of their sin because they're blinded, they're veiled through the darkness that they've been embracing. They cannot see truths. So when truth is spoken, it won't make any registration to them. They will be those that have no clarity, no ability to be able to perceive the truth. And so that darkness, when judgments are released on them, they will actually accuse God and say that he's the bad guy for releasing those judgments. Well, that's more or less what the last section's about, so I'll quit there. Father, we ask you for revelation that you'd help us. God, we want to be those that walk in the truth. We want to be those, Father, that have revelation of what it looks like to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. That while beauty and darkness rises in this last generation, we would know which one we're going to give ourselves to. And we would have increased measure of revelation to be able to do it. Holy Spirit, by your mercy, help us to gaze on your goodness, gaze on your beauty, and walk closer and closer in friendship with you. Holy Spirit, in this generation, Release an increase of the beauty of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen.